Oh, oh, this sucks. This sucks. Whose bright idea was this? I hope he didn't stake his entire identity on his invention being liked. Were you using stake puns from earlier episodes? Gosh, you really are lost without John and Austin. No, the, the joke is that he did put his identity in. Fine, whatever. Something that I've more recently come to understand is that stories are arguments. They involve a cast of characters playing out the benefits and consequences of various worldviews. Throughout the story, the character either dies, doubling down on who they've always been, or they change into what the author believes is a greater ideal. And the claims stories are making are not inconsequential. Storytellers are trying to discover and argue ways to live that are better than others. And as stated in the intro video, that has huge implications. In the next three videos, we're going to be looking at one of my favorite films, not only to see what's so impactful about it, but to see if I agree with its claim in order to better inform how I act. So let's see what we find. So here's the cheese. You can keep it going, get everything you've ever wanted, and be the great man I know you can be. Or you can turn it off, ruin everything, and no one will ever like you. It's your choice. Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs wrestles with the question of what makes someone great. The two sides of the argument are someone is great because everyone says so, or someone is great because regardless of approval, they always seek out truth and try to do what's best for everyone. Sam and Flint are the characters that make the movie's claim. Manny and Tim serve as examples of characters who do what they think is right. And lastly, and who we'll be focusing on in this episode, Brent and the mayor serve as the logical conclusion for seeking greatness through others' acceptance. But as in any argument, let's first cover some foundational motivations. What is the core ideal stated in the movie? Have you ever felt like you were a little bit different? Like you had something unique to offer the world, then you know exactly how it felt to be me. Here, we see that Flint feels like he has something unique to offer the world. The movie assumes, one, that this is a sympathetic feeling, that your answer to this rhetorical question is, yeah, I have felt that. And two, the movie assumes that offering something unique to the world is worthwhile for humans to do. Well, great. That all sounds nice and positive, but what does that even mean? Well, how does Flint offer something unique to the world? What is the number one problem facing our community today? Untied shoelaces. Which is why I've invented a laceless alternative foot covering. Spray on shoes! By inventing, or broken down further, solving problems also called growth. Problem, the untied shoelace epidemic. What would be better for humanity? Spray on shoes. Well, okay, but let's pause for a second though, because this is already a big claim that Chris and Phil are making. That the way anyone, you, me, that guy, can offer anything unique to the world is by benefiting humanity through new ideas and problem solving growing. And this obviously isn't just about inventing. You, you write a song because of the benefits of music. Or being there for someone who's stuck and needs encouragement to imagine a better life. Do that which brings forth benefit. This is the ideal of the movie. Which is profound if you stop and think about it. Should that be a goal of our lives? And what is considered positive benefit? Based on what standard? Towards what goal? In Flint's sight, the people who did it were the scientists and inventors who made drastic changes in the way we think, understand, and communicate. They solved huge problems and significantly grew how we understand this whole reality thing. But being an acclaimed inventor is not what the movie's about. Immediately after Flint shows us his solution for the biggest problem facing his community today, we see what Flint and we must overcome in order to meet the movie's stated ideal of offering something unique to the world. While Brent's motives are obviously skewed, he makes a good point. How are you going to get them off? It's in Flint's reaction that we see he actually cares more about being accepted than solving the problem. The goal of an inventor is to make things better. But if Flint's only goal was to solve the untied shoelace epidemic, then Brent's feedback would be divorced from impacting Flint's perceived self-value. The situation would play out. How are you gonna get him off, nerd? Huh. Yeah, no, that, that's a pretty good point. I'll have to think about that one and keep iterating until I solve the problem. But that's not what we get. I wanted to run away that day. 
but you can't run away from your own feet. His shoes are now a constant reminder of who he and others believe he is, a failed inventor. This is what he has to overcome in order to become a great inventor. He has to surpass deriving his value from the acceptance of others and divorce it from the success of his inventions. What's great is even at the beginning here, the resolution is offered to Flint plainly by his mom. Everyone just thinks I'm a weirdo. So? Your value doesn't come from what other people think. The world needs your originality, Flint. You have something unique to offer the world. Do what is right for everyone, regardless if people validate you for it. Which is a profound thing to say. In terms of survival, this makes sense. The growth of human consciousness involves dying to old ideas and accepting more beneficial ones. If we do and think only what our perceived culture accepts, how can we grow? So. For the sake of humanity, we can't put our value in the views of humanity. But what happens when we do? To answer that, let's look at Brent the mayor. Brent's entire identity is staked in being famous. People know him. Hey, hey it's baby Brent. Accept him. Ah, what a and want him to do things merely on the pretense that everybody knows him. Featuring a live appearance by baby Brent himself. I'll be using these bad boys to help save the town. In his sight, he has purpose and value because everyone likes him. I'm the best person in the whole town! But why did people give him that status? It's not like his role as the face of Baby Brent Sardines pushed humanity forward. He became a celebrity because he was a common talking point. Which is so weird and upsets me when I think about how that plays out in our culture. Think about it. Celebrity at some point is this weird circular logic where they're famous because we talk about them, but we talk about them because they're famous. It's like, why do we talk about people who are just merely famous? <sighs> I'm not here to fully explore that today, it's just frustrating. The point is, Brent's value is in his celebrity, and throughout the film we see Flint begin to replace him as the new household name. This begins to pull the rug out from underneath Brent until his breaking point. So there you go. You put your identity in others' opinions and eventually it'll lead to an identity crisis. Brent's character postulates that value from people is not a good long-term strategy because people are fickle, short-sighted, self-interested, and in and of themselves incapable of providing ultimate value. We are incredibly limited in scope and in years of life. How am I capable of offering ultimate value? Like it's obviously valuable to me that you guys express your appreciation for the time that I put into these analyses. But if I put my core value as a human into whether or not you guys show up. What happens if you don't? What if we continue this whole creator relationship thing until when we start dying? Who can I rest my value on then? Well, as we see in this scene, if I put my value on you and you stop watching, then my entire identity structure would collapse. An interesting evidence to pay attention to is how funny this scene is. Why is it so funny? It's funny because it's true. We unconsciously knew that his identity was precariously placed. It wouldn't be funny if his reaction here didn't make any sense. Say they made him a school teacher who loved to brighten the youth of tomorrow. And in most of his scenes, they show him saying hi to his students and talking about lesson plans. And then yeah, he admits to someone that sure, he was baby Brent when he was younger, but that was a long time ago. And then this scene plays out. It wouldn't be funny, it'd be confusing. Because his actions throughout the film would have showed us that he had a greater mission than being baby Brent. So, pay attention to that. If we know deep down that putting our identity into the acceptance of others is precarious, we need to consider that in choosing how and why we act. But Brent changes. His change is a clone of Flint's change. And while Chicken Brent is a curious conclusion to land on, who he is now is defined by... And I'm finally contributing to society! This aligns with the stated ideal that we should offer something unique to the world by acting for the benefit of humanity. And while Brent's change supports the claim of the movie, the mayor demonstrates the ending result of what happens when we derive our value from others. An interesting side point is that the mayor is older than Brent. I think the writers are playing off of the cliche that older individuals are more likely to double down on whatever they've decided life is about. Whereas like Brent, younger individuals are generally more likely to consider that they don't have it all figured out and then change accordingly. I personally wonder if it's because the stakes are higher the older we get. If I've committed 30 years to a worldview, 
admitting I was wrong that entire time is significantly weightier than if I've only committed five, thus requiring less humility in order to accept the misstep. I can understand if it's a long tradition that extends past you. Are you disrespecting your father's father or your mother's mother if you've concluded that they've been wrong for hundreds of years? Regardless of how he came to this conclusion, the mayor is convinced he knows what life is about. I want to be big. I want people to look at me and say, that is one big mayor. That's why this has to work. It has to work. Otherwise, I'm just a tiny mayor of a tiny town full of tiny sardine-sucking knuckle scrapers. He believes this so much so that people are not humans anymore. They're objects to him, either tools to facilitate a position or points on his score of acceptance. And we see this play out. He has no clue or concern into the consequences that his actions have on people. That's why without consulting anyone, I spent the entire town budget on the thing that is under this tarp. I have taken out a very high interest loan. Oh, what are you doing here? I've been up here ordering dinner for the last 10 minutes. Why, is something going on? I've gotta stop the machine. Everyone's in danger because of me. Oh, it can't be that bad. I don't know, oh, I'm out of here. This can also be read into why he eats. The food weather is the tool by which he will gain mass acceptance. So he makes what will bring him success a part of himself. Everything that he does is subordinate to this goal of being praised. And what we see as a result of this level of myopia is a morbidly obese man who puts an entire community at risk of destruction and ultimately destroys himself. This is the extreme danger of deriving one's value from the acceptance of others. Notice how the mayor has no intimate relationships. All of his relationships are transactional in nature, even using intimacy to manipulate people for his own goal. Oh, not you, Brent. No, you've always been like a son to me. <laughs> I've always felt that you were like a son to me, Flint. When I need others' acceptance to give me value, I no longer see anyone else as a person of intrinsic value, and therefore I become incapable of vulnerability and intimacy. And if you take that far enough, no one else matters but you. Either they help you, or they're just in your way. Acting for the benefit of others, regardless if you're accepted or praised for it. The characters that demonstrate that for us are Manny and Tim. Manny is such an interesting character. He only has 11 lines in the entire film, yet he's there to make one really simple and profound point. So first, let's look at what he ideals, right here. I came here for a better life. Pretty great decision, eh? He wanted to live a better life than what he had, and he says it's a great decision, but cool. I mean, what is his life now? He's behind a camera, helping Sam. He's using his knowledge of the body and health to help people. He uses his skill to fly planes to help save the town. He uses his sense of humor to make people laugh. <laughs> this is clearly a man with a lot of skills that each have its own identity associated with it. Cameraman, doctor, pilot, comedian. But Manny doesn't put who he is into any of these skills or labels. These are just tools to him that help him facilitate his overarching goal of living a better life, which he defines by doing things for the benefit of everyone. Whether he's a good comedian or not doesn't shake him. It's just a skill. This is something that's very near and dear to me. When you don't put your value into how impressive a skill is, you can get very good very quickly. Because you can objectively look at your weaknesses and failures with the sole purpose of problem solving, finding creative solutions, and getting more practiced and familiar with the craft. A lesson that is very pertinent to Flint. Wow, you're a lot better than me. Uh -huh. Tim, on the other hand, isn't a single faceted. He was kind of a hard character to understand at first. It wasn't immediately clear as to why he was so adamantly against Flynn's inventing, why he seemingly came around to support his inventing, how any of that had to do with the story of what it means to be great. To better understand why Tim's in the story, I looked at all the reasons as to why he thought Flint should stop inventing. Flint. Um, uh, don't you think it's time to give up this inventing thing? Get a real job. No, why? Well, the, all your technology stuff, it just ends in disaster. No. Dad, just give me one more chance. We both know this was an accident. I know. Can you look me in the eye and tell me you've got this under control and it's not going to end up in a disaster? Son, look, look around. I'm not sure this is good for, for people. 
maybe you should think about turning this thing off. One thing that I think would have made Tim's perspective stronger is if the filmmakers would have made it more clear how familiar he is with all of the times Flint's inventions hurt people. Most notably with... The rappers, yes, they escaped and bred at a surprising rate. Which still strike fear in the eyes of children. Billy, just play dead. This is Tim's entire angle. He wants to do what's good for people. And in seeing that Flint's inventing has a pattern of creating problems, Tim suggests to Flint that he just follow the way that he has contributed to society. I want you to work full time at the tackle shop. The tackle shop? Oh, Dad, no. Tackle is a good career. Please, a small scale job that has provided a useful service to the community, as well as a means to support his family. It's these core value differences between Tim and Flint which creates all of their communication problems. Tim isn't as mature with his emotions or his imagination. And then Flint is too unconscientious to see the reaching consequences of his actions. For instance, rat birds. So this creates a language barrier where Flint single-mindedly moves towards his goal and Tim can't express what he really feels, masking it in metaphor, leaving Flint confused as to what the problem even is. On top of that, Tim doesn't know how to imagine the potential of Flint's inventions. And he isn't familiar with the process of exploring the unknown, which is inherently trial and error. And it's this difficulty in communication which creates the misconception in Flint that his dad isn't proud of him, but he's missing the forest for the trees. Throughout the entire film, it's clear through Tim's actions that he is proud. He wants to be around him and relate to him. He let Flint experiment on him when he was younger. He even trusts him and lets him continue on with the food weather. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dad. Oh, sure. He longs for a better relationship with him. He knows that Flint is the only one who can save the town. And in the end, he doesn't say anything about loving him now that his inventions work. He doesn't even mention it. In essence, he says, I've always seen you. I now see that I was wrong in not being able to imagine what success could look like, but I've always loved you. This is how Tim fits into the story. He's an argument for how value and acceptance has to be unconditional for us to live freely. Thanks for trying to set me straight. Figured it out a little late, I guess. Tim just does what he thinks is right. He doesn't look to other people to define him. He's a fisherman who owns a humble business, and he assumes that his son understands the same principle. What did I say? that he doesn't need to work, achieve anything, or be liked by others for his dad to love him or be proud of him. Not every sardine is, is meant to swim, son. Tim loves Flint for being. The logical end of understanding unconditional value is that you're now free to be broken and in progress. You don't need a label, a badge, a resume to be a worthwhile individual. And because you're free to be in progress, you just are where you are and you practice to be better tomorrow which enables you to grow very fast. You more objectively see the function of what you do rather than being what you do, and you more effectively use your skills for the core value of benefiting others rather than splitting that focus between proving your worth. So those are the two sides of the argument. And while the correct path is probably obvious at this point, I'd encourage you to not jump to a side so quickly and sit down and think, why? because there is no obvious moral choice. We can only have morals based on a greater ideal to move towards. And if there is no greater ideal, then the mayor's way of life is hard to argue against because everything's meaningless in the sight of the eventual entropy of the universe. Unless, again, there's a greater purpose to strive for, which is what Chris and Phil are saying with Flint and Sam. So let's now, finally, look at Flint and Sam, the loudest characters have changed throughout the story which means the clearest expression of the theme. Both Flint and Sam war between who they think is right and who they think is accepted. I too was a nerd. Sam loves the science of weather. She just wants to spend all of her time studying it and she couldn't care less what she looks like. But because she wasn't accepted by her childhood peers, she felt pressured to make a decision on what she valued more. Acceptance and being socially low friction or contributing what she thinks is meaningful. She chooses acceptance and alters who she is to become someone she doesn't care for. Another symptom of living defined by others is your inability to meaningfully connect. The movie doesn't show Sam having any close friends. When you're acting as a character you don't believe in, how do you expect to have any intimate relationships? What are you supposed to talk about or relate on? If you craft who you are to be another character, that impacts how you look, how you talk, 
and who you associate with. All you're capable of having are proxy conversations. Empty talk for the sake of appearing like you care, but you can't passionately express what gets you out of bed in the morning, which is what we see. I mean, <laughs> wow, they're shiny. I mean, <laughs> The clouds probably have water in them. It's a solid, it's a liquid, it's a viscoelastic polymer made of polypeptide chains. Would you eat it? I mean, it tastes good. Ironically, it's Flint who encourages her to not care what others think. And in a way, communicates what his mom communicated to him when he was younger. Four eyes, four eyes, you need glasses to see. <laughs> Flint laughing is the equivalent to his mom's. So? People probably thought that these guys were weirdos too. Saying, yeah, people say stupid things, but that doesn't affect your value. And then he tells her she has something unique to offer the world, which will be better in the long run. Why not? I mean, this is the real you, right? Smart, bespectacled. Who wouldn't want to see that? There's this nice beat that I noticed in the script that was cut from the film for one reason or another. I'm bummed that it was, because it seems like it would have been a nice accent on Sam's decision to be who she wants to be. It's when she's in the back of the van by herself and she finds the Doppler Weather Radar 2000 Turbo. In the script, it first plays out as it does in the film. She puts the glasses on and off, deciding who she wants to be. Now that she has the glasses on, she sees the Doppler machine behind her. She opens it, but in the script, instead of it starting up immediately, it begins to boot up and she smiles. She can see her reflection there in the screen, and she finally likes what she sees. It would have been a nice beat saying, boom, she can finally rest in her cognitive cogency, informed by her decision to make her worldview and her actions one. Might have just said that to get you to like me. So you really thought having allergies would make you more attractive? Yeah. And finally, we're at Flint, the main character of change in the story and the greatest insight into how Chris and Phil think that we should live. The central cause of conflict that fuels the entire story is that Flint wants to be a great inventor, but he doesn't define what that means. A great inventor can be described in two ways. A person who impacts human consciousness positively, or a person who is considered by many to be a great inventor. The problem is that the result that these definitions are describing is not mutually exclusive. A person who significantly helps humanity will probably also be praised. But to further clarify these definitions, we have to ask. If someone is praised for being a great inventor, but has not brought significant benefit to humanity, does praise alone make them a great inventor? As well as if someone does bring meaningful impact and is not praised, are they a great inventor? Like for instance, fun fact segment. This poster here of Philo Taylor Farnsworth refers to the man who was largely credited to inventing the modern television. He was the first to figure out how to transmit an image through a wire by recreating the image line by line, inspired by plowing his parents' farm. But very few people know his name. Does that make him a great inventor? Aww. Flint has not considered the distinction between these two definitions and holds both of them to be true. And because of that, he constantly swims between one definition and the other as he struggles to understand his value. There are moments when he genuinely tries to help the people of Swallow Falls, but his true motivations are revealed when he's forced to choose one definition over the other. Leave the machine on, continue to receive praise, mass acceptance, but at the cost of potentially hurting the people he's trying to help, or turn it off to save the town and potentially lose the praise and acceptance. He chooses potentially hurting people, but now he's got a problem. Flint hears the potential danger of his machine, but needs to convince himself and others that his motivations are still to help people. In order to justify his decision, he needs to create and believe a fantasy. I know, it's great. Bigger portion sizes. Everyone loves it. Then when others have a better argument to what's happening in the real world, he has to ignore them and tell them to live in his fantasy. Why can't you just be happy for me and go say the weather or something? Jeez. Which is a trend we've seen in the mayor, Brent, Sam, and now Flint. If your value comes from the changing tides of the opinions people have of you, you have to live a lie in order to continually entertain their gaze. You have to become who you think they want you to be, rather than figuring out who you think you should be based on your own intuition, evidence, and logic. I love these three scenes that are back to back, really driving in that point. 
The design of each of these scenes is the same. A character is confronted with hard evidence that the food weather is getting out of control. The character then rejects evidence because turning it off means the gaze of everyone's attention will stop. So then the character appeals to the evidence of consensus. It makes everyone happy so it must be good, and keeps doing what will bring them acceptance and attention regardless of its potential harm. In order to convince themselves that they're still doing the right thing, they have to use this BS argument that everyone's happy, so everything's fine. By the end of this sequence, we see that Flint has doubled down on his self-delusion. When he's confronted by his dad, he's largely ignorant and unobservant. But by the time he's confronted by Sam, he's seen and understood the destructive potential and still chooses to keep the machine on, which makes his last statement to her way scarier. I just want to be liked right now, and you're getting in the way of that, so why can't you just forget about our impending doom and let me have this? Which, structurally in the story, is the perfect place for the truth to hit him over the head like a sack of bricks. His lies have caught up with him, his fantasy crumbles, and he is faced with the consequences of his actions. One thing I love is how this story addresses the tension between happiness as a measure for truth as opposed to clear evidence and logic. It's saying that what makes us happy right now is not always good in the long run, which is a bold statement to say in the context of our current culture, but I think one that needs to be considered. We can't mindlessly follow the novelties and trends that make us feel happy. Wake up, sheeple! <laughs> It's a myopic way to navigate life. We need to constantly scrutinize where we invest our time, our money, and brain power, lest we be like Earl and the rest of the townspeople. I know Flint Lockwood made the food, but it was made to order. And now it's time for all of us to pay the bill. We just accepted what we were given without questioning it. We are as much at fault. Anyway, the truth hits and everyone sees that Flint's invention has caused all this destruction. Flint finds himself in a similar situation to Brent identity crisis. Who he is is an inventor, and if an inventor doesn't help people, then he's useless. He's like one of his own failed inventions, worthless and unwanted. Trash. Which is the moment that leads him to become more an inventor than he's ever been. His dad comes and offers a single gesture. When it rains, you put on a coat. If you're a fisherman, you can't let the rain stop you. You put on a coat and keep going. When everything falls apart, get back in that lab, Flint. Who cares if no one likes you? You can still do what's right. This is not only the encouragement that he needed, but Flint finally sees that his dad believes in him and that his failures don't impact who he is, he decides who he is. So for the first time, Flint's motivations are pure. He's not doing it for the acceptance of anyone. He just wants to help save the people of his town. This shift in motivation forms a bridge between Flint and his father, finally allowing him to see what his dad was saying all along. Thanks for trying to set me straight. Figured it out a little late, I guess. So there you go. That's what Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs tells us about how we should live. There's a few takeaways from this series. Firstly, for writers. Notice how the characters in the story were created to embody each side of the thematic argument. You could write this entire story starting with the theme of you should do what you believe is best for humanity rather than what people accept you for. And once you have that, now you just need a main character who's going to learn that, and then you will build your cast based on what they will teach your main character or how their change will also accent the theme. Flint needed to learn who not to be, so he needed the mayor. Flint needed to learn who to be, so he needed Manny and his dad. And then Sam and Brent are there to explore other ways that living for the acceptance of others could manifest. So remember that when writing, you don't just think of a cast of characters that you like. They have a specific purpose. They affect each other. And then how they affect each other is what your story ends up saying. So if you don't intentionally design what their relationships are for, then your story is going to make a lot of disjointed claims, causing your story to be unfocused and ultimately less emotionally impactful. Secondly, if we believe Cloudy's claim that you need to do what you love for the benefit of humanity and do it regardless if you're accepted for it, then these are the things that we all need to particularly sit down, think about, wrestle with, write about, and articulate to ourselves. Stories allow us to look at ourselves and honestly see when we're acting like their characters, using their story as a model for our own growth. Then we can be better informed on how we want to act, and more importantly, why. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Why or why not? Keep the conversation going. Make a response video. Write a blog post. It's these values and stories that need to be continually discussed and scrutinized so we can best know how to act, too. <laughs> Please keep the conversation going on our Discord, link in the description. And if you find this content valuable, please support us on Patreon. It's the only way this will continue at this rate. Now that we've finished the Cloudy series, join us next time for everybody's favorite animated classic, 
the Shawshank Redemption. This video was produced by Frozen was actually genius, which which may be true. It may be like on another level, <laughs> but I'm I'm pretty excited. I get to say this from here on out. That's that's fantastic. Uh, it was also produced by Connor Fitzer, David M, Caitlin Taylor, Miley Greenwell, and Matt Laskowski. Thanks, guys. I'll see y'all next time.